Good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. Um, I'm Jim Jones. I am the Executive Chairman Emeritus at the Atlantic Council. I have no idea what that title means, but I'm here. Um, I'm thrilled that so many of you could join us for this very important conversation today. And today we're delighted to welcome Her Excellency Madame Florence Barry, Minister of the Armed Forces for the French Republic, for a conversation on U.S.-French defense cooperation. The Atlantic Council is committed to U.S. engagement with all of our allies to promote a free, secure, and prosperous world. At the core of that mission is the belief that we are stronger together. And this is all the more urgent today in the era, era of great power competition. In this regard, the Franco-American relationship has been particularly unique among our alliances in Europe and around the world. France has uh, been a valued friend of the United States since before our nation's founding, and is today a critical strategic partner. In the past decade alone, our two countries have worked closely together to fight terrorism in the Sahel, to end ISIS domination of Syria and Iraq as members of the global coalition, to exchange operational military intelligence, and to cooperate on cyber defense capabilities. Within NATO, <clears throat> France and the United States have worked together to respond to Russian aggression in the Ukraine and strengthen deterrence in Eastern Europe. And I can tell you from personal experience that the French armed forces are the best in Europe. I'm very pleased that this cooperation has continued steadfastly under this administration and the presidency of President Emmanuel Macron, despite occasional policy disagreements. President Macron was in um, April of 2018, uh, President Trump's first guest for a state visit. Friends can disagree, and our two countries have, have disagreed or misunderstood each other in the past. And I'm sure Minister Pali will address the issues of contention today from the situation in Syria to the Iran nuclear agreement or sometimes misunderstandings about the development of European defense. But despite these policy differences, the US and France are bound by liberal democratic values and common challenges, and cooperation does not stop uh, when friends occasionally disagree. At every level, the US and France work together to defend each other, our common allies, and our partners. So we are thrilled to have Minister Bali here today to hear her important perspective on the US-French relationship and opportunities for further cooperation. The minister has served as the Minister of the Armed Forces for the French Republic for almost two years under the leadership of President Macron. Under President Macron, France has risen as a critical voice for European integration and defense cooperation. And since taking this position, the minister's commitment to U.S.-French cooperation in tackling security challenges have solidified her as a powerful voice in the, for the transatlantic partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, after her remarks, the minister will engage in a conversation with the audience moderated by Ben Haddad, and that I welcome here as our new director for the Future Europe Initiative. And with that, please join me in welcoming Madam Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. Finally, I made it uh, last September. I was scheduled to talk here, but then a day before flying, I picked up the US newspapers and, and read, Hurricane Florence hits the east coast of the US. That was meant to be a discreet visit to DC. And then it got worse. The Wall Street Journal, I believe, ran a piece that said, Florence, an emerging threat to the security of the United States. So I started to be seriously worried. On top of this, I heard that my friend Gavin Williamson from the UK had given a speech at the Atlantic Council just days before I was supposed to speak. And the title was something like um, the United States most important ally, most important ally. 
and obviously MI6 had hacked my speech and clearly I had to postpone my trip. But here I am today and no hurricane, no hacking and it's a great honor to be hosted by the Atlantic Council and I would like to thank uh, uh, the president of Atlant the Atlantic Council, the vice president, you, General Jones, uh, for welcoming me. And this is a remarkable institution. You have world-class research. We support it and plan to deepen our cooperation. As someone from my team will join the Atlantic Council later this summer. You also have an impressive record of speakers here, and it's hard for anyone to take up the challenge, but I'll try. And today, I'll endeavor to talk to you about America's most effective ally, about our alliance, about how we make each other stronger, and about why this alliance is more important than ever, given the way our world is changing. In just three days, it will be officially spring. And with spring, the eternal return of that pale sun on the hills of Normandy, on its impeccable loans, its forest of white crosses, on these names of glorious Americans fallen for our freedom. On these monuments to friendship and sacrifice that will long outlast us. America is our ally in the deepest sense of the world. America has been our fortress in the worst hours of last century. Twice for World War I and then World War II and the Cold War, the US has broken its long-standing posture of not entangling its peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice, as George Washington put it in his farewell address. But on these occasions, we should remind, be reminded Europe was not only a place of humor and caprice, it was also the playground of a major strategic revolvery involving the US against Germany and allies, then against the Soviet Union. Now, that the strategic rivalry is moving to Asia and Europe is no longer its main playground, a question mark has emerged. It's not discouraged by the current atmosphere of withdrawal, withdrawal from battlefields, from treaties, from trade pacts, from all this web of bonds whose collective meaning is deeper than the individual benefits generated by each. Now, as far as France is concerned, we believe in facts. And facts speak of the incredible US commitment to European security. Congress has appropriated billions of dollars for the European Deterrence Initiative. There are thousands of US troops in a fair number of European countries. The US has supported the so-called enhanced forward presence as part of NATO's deterrence posture in the East. And all these facts have a theory namely the national defense strategy, which is without any equivoque in its support to Europe. We therefore have a thousand reasons to say, 
US, thank you. And France, maybe more so than many others. We have an excellent bilateral relation with the US. The US is supporting us in Africa, in the Near East. Without the US, our ability to defeat terrorism and protect our security would be significantly diminished. But what Europeans are worried about is this. Will the US commitment be perennial? Should we assume that it will go on as was the case in the past 70 years? The Europeans look at recent events and they see that Europe's security and environment has been sorely tested. In 28, Georgia was torn in to pieces. In 2014, it was Ukraine's turn. So when the Europeans heard this July at NATO that unless their defense expenses moved to 2% GDP, the US would quote unquote, do its own thing, they were not reassured. They started to pause and wonder if the unthinkable might be slowly happening. As a consequence, they have started to prepare just in case. The military always prepare. They've started to look honestly at what they would be really able to do if left on their own. Yes, the Europeans have made a lot of progress recently in addressing their shortfalls. European defense expenses have been rising since 2015 after a 25 year decrease following the end of the Cold War. We've come up with a European Defense Fund, a structured cooperation mechanism. Many fellow European countries are launching large scale military procurement programs, but for all this progress, the reality still remains unflattering. And if you put together the US and Europe, you will see that the US has 71% of surveillance aircraft, 72% of attack helicopters, 81% of strategic transport, 91% of air tankers, 92% of male and hail UAVs, 100% of strategic bombers and ballistic missile advanced alert systems. So the Europeans have a hell of a homework in front of them if they want to stand on their two feet and really share the burden with America. And France wants to be at the forefront of this effort. Yes, the Europeans need to address their capability shortfalls one by one, especially concerning the key enablers, strategic transport, ISR, air tankers, cruise missiles. For this, we fully support the US insistence on the 2%. President Macron has even suggested recently that the Europeans might enshrine this objective in a treaty. The Europeans also need to consolidate their defense industry. They have 20 different types of combat aircraft, while the US has only six. 
and that's a serious distraction of resources and a limit of interoperability. With Germany, for instance, we have decided to build together the future European battle tank and the future European combat aircraft system. We should support every effort to develop European solutions wherever possible. The European Defence Fund should support that. But I know, sometimes I hear people say it's protectionism. And I say, think again. Belgium buys F-35. Sweden buys Patriot. Poland buys HIMARS. Europe has the single most open arm market. And I'm personally more concerned at the notion that the strength of NATO's solidarity might be made conditional on allies buying this or that equipment. The alliance should be unconditional. Otherwise, it's not an alliance. NATO's solidarity clause is called Article 5, not Article F35. But back to Europe. We need equipment, but we also need a propensity to use it. Ability will take you only this far if willingness is wanting. And France has been campaigning tirelessly for the Europeans to develop a common strategic culture. There was a debate in 2003 as to whether the Europeans were from Mars or from Venus. Well, France has a new space policy, and as you will see, we are now offering every European country a one-way ticket to Mars. <laughs> we must grow the notion that a threat to our fellow Europeans is a threat to each of them, and that we need to step up and help without waiting for the US to always foot the bill. This is precisely the reason why President Macron recently launched the so-called European Intervention Initiative. The idea is to form a group of more capable and more willing states that will team up to plan and one day conduct operations together. President Macron is also suggesting to strengthen European solidarity through Article 42-7 of the European Union Treaty. But security is not only a matter of keto, kilter, culture, sorry. It's also a matter of rules and pacts. The Europeans must also develop their voice as regards Europe's security architecture. Europeans should not be free riders of their own security. If there are armed control treaties that affect their security, they should be part of the negotiation. They must reappropriate the field. This is all the more important as the INF Treaty is in trouble and New START will expire soon. All these things sound self evident, but in fact, they are not. It's a cultural change that needs time to take hold. 
France, from that point of view, is in a particular position. We have always had our own path within the alliance, developing an independent nuclear deterrent and occasionally causing some irritation to the US, whether at Suez in 1956 or by exporting the NATO HQ to Brussels in 1966, for example. We have long been the bad boy in NATO meetings for years, while in practice being one of the most active allies in the field. And from this point of view, there are two essential points on which I would like to insist. One, that building a European autonomy should never be seen as a move against the United States. And two, that it should certainly not become a reason for the US to be less engaged, quite the contrary. The US and Europe have more in common than anyone else. We share the same values, we are faced with the same threats, from terror to the resurgence of the 19th century style power politics, China and Russia and the like. We fight the same wars. We have fundamentally the same worldview, although we may have significant nuance on climate, on trade, or Iran. NATO was meant into Alia to keep the Americans in and the Russians out. We do not want to reverse the terms of this equation. We want America solidly steeped in NATO. Autonomy should be a variation on friendship. And European autonomy should not become a cause for the US to be less engaged. I strongly believe that it would not be in the interests of the US to be perceived as less committed to the security of Europe for a number of reasons. History first. Every time the US has retreated from Europe, threats have come back to haunt the US itself. Just look at what had happened in the 20th century. Reputation then, if US commitment is perceived as weakened, it will be further tested by adversaries. There was Georgia and there was Ukraine, and if we have another Georgia or another Ukraine within NATO, this will not only be a catastrophe, it will also signal in the eyes of the outside world a drastic reduction in US power, with many negative consequences above the horizon. Unity also, because if the US is less strong in Europe, Adversaries of the US will also try to split Europe and court part or all of Europe against the US. And we already see signs of this. Think Belt and Road, for instance. Europe has its internal issues to deal with and we don't want them to be compounded by external attempts to divide us. I believe it would be detrimental to the US if part of Europe was co-opted from outside. Partnership too. 
because the threats are becoming more varied and the US will be stronger to face them with Europe rather than despite Europe. The alliance is not a one-way operation. There is a strong payback for the US, which is not limited to the influence the US derives from its security assistance. And no area, in my view, exemplifies this better than terrorism. Seen from a domestic angle, terrorism is a single security issue of greatest concern to French citizens. Like the US, France suffered from terror with catastrophic attacks on our territory. We are part of that fight. We are and we want to be a robust presence alongside the US to defeat terror. After 9-11, our special forces went in with the US into Afghanistan, where we stayed for 11 years. And we lost 90, 90 of the nation's children to the war. In 2013, when Al-Qaeda was about to topple the government of Mali and establish a murderous caliphate in the heart of Africa, France took the lead and intervened with fantastic US support. We rolled back the terrorists, and to this day, we work to stabilize the region with 4,500 troops in the Sahel and important results against high value targets. I believe this difficult work is in the interest also of the United States. In 2015, when the US set up a coalition to defeat ISIS in Iraq, France was among the very first to enlist. We contributed heavily to the fight with guns and planes. Later, as America was contemplating a drawdown from Syria, we've been among the, among the first to argue for maintaining a US force. And today, we are carefully studying the recent US offer to maintain a residual presence in cooperation with a few partners. Beyond this case, I have a broader message, a simple message. You can count on us. We will be there, not only for today's wars, but also for those of tomorrow. CBRN, space, cyber, hybrid, information wars. When Assad used chemical weapons, France and the UK were there with the US to deliver precision strikes on the chemical facilities. We will do it again if necessary. And take note, Idlib. In space, we face similar threats. The development of anti-satellite weapons or the infamous grazing satellites, one of, which, one of which I have exposed recently. We must team up against these threats. And last, I would say a word about disinformation. I'm told it comes from a Russian world. I don't talk Russian, so disinformatia. Who knows why? In any case, this is not a passing fad. It's an enduring feature of future conflict. 
and we will have to face it together. There are examples every day. Some stooges recently claimed France was involved in a massacre in the Central African Republic. I say rubbish. Others claimed that the Syrian regime had arrested French military forces. I say rubbish. This does not apply to theaters of war only. Sometimes even our democracies are at stake and they must be protected. President Macron recently suggested the creation of an agency to help Europeans shield their election against outside interference. I don't need to tell you about the importance of the challenge. And this is only the beginning. We will need to chart this new territory of conflict where genuine democracies start with a disadvantage. Because lying is not a culture of state. And transparency is a self-enforcing norm in the information age. On these many challenges, you will find us at your side. But I've talked too much. As we depart from DC tomorrow, I hope to leave you with the impression that France will always do her utmost to be a robust ally against the threats of today and of tomorrow. We will do our best with the Europeans to take a larger share of the burden. We will call it autonomy and we will count on you to hear in this world nothing else that the bonds of a healthy, independent, robust friendship, as befits the relationship between America and her most effective or her most important, and certainly her oldest ally, whatever Gavin Williamson can think and say. Thank you very much. Director of Future Europe Initiative here at the Council. Minister Parly, thank you so much for uh, your remarks, for this very comprehensive uh, speech. There's uh, many points I, I could underline, but I think, uh, especially what you said in conclusion on how European autonomy, investment in its own defense is obviously not against the United States, but the best way to build a more mature and balanced partnership uh, to defend our values and common interests in the long run. And I think that's a very important message to have here. Before turning to the room, uh, I'd just like to ask you maybe a couple questions to, to follow up. And my first question would be on, on Brexit. Uh, President Macron wrote uh, this very ambitious letter on European Renaissance uh, last week to his European partners. And he, he started with Brexit, saying that uh, this was a cautionary tale, that it should not make us complacent, but also pushing a few uh, proposals to build the defense and security relationship with Great Britain afterwards. What does what does it mean for this project of European autonomy and defense, and, and how is, is France going to respond to it? Well, first of all, um, Brexit uh, um, is a difficult uh, issue for Europeans. Uh, I mean, it's not a good news that a, a European member state uh, tries to get out of something which uh, took years of efforts to be, to be built. Then we are in, a, in democracies and the um, British people uh, cast a vote and sent a message. So we have to 
take it into account. Very long negotiations uh, have happened. Now we are at the end of the process and it's up to uh, the uh, British <coughs> Parliament, House of Commons, to say how to end up this process. Now, um, from the military and defense perspective, um, of course, it's also a difficult moment that we have in front of us. But I will express my views from France. We are very confident in the very strong relationship we've built with our uh, British uh, friends. We have a strong bilateral cooperation. We signed a Lancaster House Treaty in 2010. And uh, we are working hard uh, to improve, increase the scope of the cooperation between our two countries. And of course, we understand that between the United Kingdom and uh, the European Union, Union, the day the Brexit will be implemented, we will need a kind of uh, treaty or agreement to organize um, the uh, cooperation between the two. Why do, do we think so? Because we know that the Uni United Kingdom is keen to uh, be remain part of um, European's continent security. And uh, we also know that we will need uh, united con contribution uh, to uh, the Europe's security. So President Macron, in a very unusual way, um, wrote a letter that was published in the 28 countries uh, through newspapers last week. I said unusual because usually when uh, a president uh, wants to express his, view, his views on European matters, uh, he, he does it in a European circle uh, uh, under the European uh, processes. And the reason why President Macron uh, choose, uh, chose this way of expressing his views is to address to people because we are very close to the European elections. And he wanted to share his views about the future of uh, the European Union, which is very much at stake. And among the proposal he made, um, he said that it would be probably useful that, as Europeans, we think about a treaty to formalize what we want to do uh, in the field of defense and security. And I mentioned the example of the 2% uh, uh, GDP target that could be included in such a treaty, how we could combine uh, the uh, Article 42-7 uh, of the uh, European Treaty and the Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. And on top of that, we are sure that we need a way to formalize the future bond between uh, the United Kingdom and uh, Europe. So that's why uh, this treaty seems very necessary, uh, whatever uh, you consider uh, around uh, NATO and, uh, and Europe, we need something uh, between the United Kingdom and Europe. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but before turning to the audience, I just had one question also to follow up on what you said about China. You had very strong words saying that uh, Europe should not be picked apart by its, its competitors and external powers. Uh, we heard the European Commission last week put out a document calling China a systemic rival, which is uh, a tougher language than is, it usually comes from European documents. Uh, and France is also uh, a member of operations uh, Freedom of Navigation in South China Sea alongside the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, what more should Europe do to uh, respond to the challenge of the rise in China? Well, I think we should not be naive regarding China. 
when we launched the process of the uh, military planning uh, law uh, preparation, we had a kind of uh, white book, uh, which was not completely a white book, but a strategic review. And uh, we updated all the threats that uh, are surrounding us. And among that threats, we identified China uh, as a threat. And of course, we thought about uh, defense and security issues. But there are others. And we know that from an economic perspective, uh, we are also under strong pressure, and uh, there is a, a very strong debate in the US, and, but also in Europe, around uh, the uh, Huawei uh, ability to um, spread and uh, um, install equipment that could or might uh, be uh, a tool to um, um, to uh, convey information to the intelligence, uh, Chinese intelligence service. So uh, we should not be naive. Um, we know that uh, uh, China is investing a lot in our Western economies. I don't know exactly how it works in the with the United States, but for Europe, it's true to say that China had invested. Uh, in uh, the, uh, the uh, Le Pirée's uh, mm -hmm. harbor uh, is trying to do the same in other places in Europe and also outside Europe, investing in the Sri Lanka, investing in Pacific islands, creating debts uh, in those countries, which then um, uh, create a dependency uh, um, between those countries and China. So. This could change the strategic game, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a strategic perspective. And you mentioned uh, the um, freedom of navigation. Um, we uh, uh, repeatedly uh, made some statements about uh, the necessity to comply with uh, the international rules among which uh, the freedom of navigation. And uh, to complement that statement, we also sail on a regular basis with our Navy in the South China Sea, among others. I know the, uh, the American Navy is also very present, uh, the UK Navy as well, the Australian Navy uh, is doing the same. In order to uh, uh, show that uh, this freedom must be practiced um, in, uh, in, the, in the field. So we are not going to um, abandon this uh, right and this uh, freedom of navigation. And the um, um, carrier strike group will be in the Indo-Pacific Ocean uh, in the coming uh, months. It will not go to, to the South China Sea this time, but we, there will be probably a number of opportunities in the future to be considered. Thank you very much. Let me open it up to uh, the audience for questions. I just beg you to ask questions and not uh, give long remarks as we just have uh, some time. Bill. Uh, William Drosiak at McClarty Associates. I wonder, if you, could you elaborate more on France's Indo-Pacific strategy? And in particular, since China is emerging as the biggest strategic threat for the United States, <clears throat> do you see the, uh, Europe uh, joining the United States in a, in a common approach to contain China's uh, strategic ambition? I would not uh, talk um, as a, a European spokeswoman uh, because <laughs> I cannot only talk as a, a French speaker. Um, it's true to say that France is, uh, in a way, an Indo-Pacific country. We have 1.5 million citizens uh, living in Indo-Pacific French territories which is a bit unknown, but which is a fact. 
And on top of that, we have more than 200,000 uh, citizens living in the area in uh, uh, foreign countries. So we have specific strategic interest in the, in the area. That's why I'm not sure that there are so many European countries having the same uh, strategic interest in the region. And um, the UK um, are very, is very present in the, in the area, but I, I will not uh, uh, elaborate too much on the uh, potential position of other European countries re regarding uh, this region. Uh, from a strategic and military perspective. Mm. So, um, as I said, uh, we are ready to continue to be present uh, uh, with our um, uh, ships. And we also want to uh, be more present alongside with two major um, um, uh, countries in the area, I mean India, and I'm in Australia. Uh, when President Macron went to India, then to Australia, uh, he um, shared his vision to create a kind of Indo-Pacific um, axis or relationship. And uh, I must say that uh, since I've been appointed as a, a defense minister, uh, I went twice to Australia already. And uh, we are really keen on building up a very strong strategic relationship based, of course, on industrial interest, as we are prepared to build and sell um, some submarines uh, in Australia. But more than that, submarines is a way to illustrate the kind of relationship, strong relationship we want to establish with such a country. The same for India. Um, I mentioned the uh, uh, aircraft uh, uh, carrier strike group. Um, we will sail in the uh, Indo -Oce Indian Ocean in the coming weeks and months. We will have common exercises with the Indian Navy. Uh, which are planned on a regular basis. So we try to build up um, a very strong relationship with countries that are concerned by Chinese uh, development and Chinese uh, uh, growing presence in the area. And uh, we are also very keen to develop such relationship with major democracies in the area. Uh, thanks, Sophia. Sophia Besch was uh, joining the Atlantic Council as a non-resident fellow based in Berlin with the simple mission to bring Germany to 2%. To <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Minister. My question is on the future of European defense industrial cooperation. At the Munich Security Conference, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel said that a lack of common arms export controls was the biggest obstacle on the way towards a European Defense Union. I was wondering where do you see that issue resolved, not just between France and Germany, but uh, for all of Europe? And uh, if I may, what might that be? Uh, what might that? How might that affect U.S. Uh, participation in European defense capabilities? Sensitive uh, question, um, but uh, you're right. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, our homework, I would say. Um, I do not share um, Chancellor Merkel's view on the um, um, uh, respective efficiencies of uh, arms control export regulations. I think we have. Uh, very strong arm controls regulation in both countries. And I wouldn't like you to, to believe that uh, the French system is uh, weak compared to the German one. 
Um, when we signed the uh, Aix-la Chapelle Treaty uh, in January this year to uh, bind even more st strongly uh, the relations between our two countries, including uh, the uh, defense uh, questions, uh, we knew that we should solve some questions that were solved in the past with the uh, Debray-Schmidt um, uh, agreement. And at the moment when uh, Germany and France decides to uh, start new uh, uh, equipment programs together as uh, the battle tank of the future or the uh, new um, uh, aircraft fighter. Um, it is necessary to solve these kind of issues from the beginning because we all know that the European market is first a very small market for arms exportation, and second, as I said, a very open market to competition. And I will not come back to the several examples of European countries buying uh, foreign, non-European equipments, I would say. So these questions must be solved. I know that uh, uh, it's a very sensitive question for the German public opinion, but I'm quite confident in our desire on both sides to solve this issue, and it has to be solved. Let me just take uh, a couple last questions uh, at once uh, before we yeah. wrap up, and I just want to say that uh, the minister will leave the room just before, so stay seated uh, at the end before uh, before the end. We had a, a question over here. Thank you, Madam Minister Sherry Goodman, board director at the Atlantic Council. I'd like to ask you um, how you're using climate security cooperation, which you're doing today in the South Pacific um, and in Africa to advance your defense objectives of countering China and uh, defeating terrorism. I know you have a very active cooperation in NUMEA, uh, Climate Security Observatory. At the same time, uh, PACOM is about to launch a, a, a defense environmental cooperation through New Zealand with some of the same objectives. So I think there's opportunities to uh, extend our cooperation on these shared objectives. And let's take just maybe another question. Sure. Can you? Uh, Sandy Verschbau here at the Atlantic Council, formerly at NATO. Uh, you mentioned the INF Treaty in your remarks, and I certainly agree that uh, European allies need to be part of the discussion on uh, how to deal with uh, the Russian violation. Uh, but does France already have a view on whether a military response is needed if the Russians go ahead? And would you favor a dual track approach that would make decisions on deployments but offer some kind of uh, arms control deal to reduce the competition? Well, <clears throat> I'll start with the, uh, the last one. Um, the um, INF treaty I is not in a good position, and uh, this is not uh, the responsibility of uh, the US nor uh, the European. Uh, now it's a uh, fact uh, Russia does not comply with the commitments uh, it took in the past. And this creates a um, major threat for Europeans because the uh, impact of the new system uh, developed by the Russians will be on the European territory, if any. So I think that uh, we should uh, try to convince first Russia to comply to this treaty. I know this is maybe a dream because uh, uh, repeated uh, efforts were already made uh, to do so. But um, 
I'm sure that um, it's a kind of uh, strategic communication that we have to develop around that. Still, if Russia does not comply in the coming weeks, we could be in a position uh, early August where the INF Treaty is over. And then, what should be the relevant answer? Is it to develop a conventional answer to the Russian development? Uh, are we able, when I say are we, I mean the US or uh, other countries, to uh, build up uh, equipment to answer? Is it the right answer? I'm not sure, but uh, this has to be discussed within the, the NATO um, alliance. And I'm sure that uh, the next uh, meeting plan in June will be the right moment to share what's going on and to share views on the best alliance answer to this question. I underline the alliance answer, because as I said, we are very much concerned and we are potentially the target of it. Um, back to your question. Um, I'm convinced that there are lots of uh, new cooperation projects to be, to be de developed on the, on the climate uh, field, and that climate could be uh, a source of new uh, conflicts, uh, wars uh, that we have not fully taken into account in our way of thinking of the threats around us. So we have to be extremely cautious, cautious and be uh, conscious that this is a, a new source of threats and uh, instability. Mr. Barry, I really want to thank you for these uh, fascinating remarks. Uh, and, and thank you very much for joining us this morning at, at the Atlantic Council. Please stay seated as uh, the minister can, can leave. And uh, please join me in, in, in thanking her for this morning. Thank you.